but you can only ask questions live during the talk. Today, I have the pleasure and privilege of hosting Jürgen Lisenfeld from uh, Karlsruhe Institute of Technologies, KIT, who will talk about material defects in superconducting quantum circuits. Uh, thank you to uh, Jihan for inviting him. Jürgen has received his PhD in physics in 2007 in the group of Professor Alexei Ustinov. From 2008 to 2009, Jürgen was a postdoc at KIT, followed by a postdoc in the group of Hans Mui at TU Delft before returning back to KIT, which is where Jürgen is today. And hello, Jürgen, how are you? Hello, Satko, I'm very fine, how are you? So, very happy to be here. Thanks for having me. So am I, so am I. I'm glad you could join us. Thanks for accepting our invitation. Are you, where are you today? I'm calling from Karlsruhe, Germany. So this is southwest of Germany. 15 kilometers from here would be the River Rhine, forming the border with France and north of the Black Forest. So nice place in Germany. And I think you get the gold star for most, uh, you know, detailed geospatial locationing of your location. So that's great. <laughs> anyway, so with that, Jürgen, um, the stage is yours. Take it away. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thanks a lot. Yeah. So welcome to my talk. I'm talking about superconducting quantum computers, of course. And that's also how I'm going to start. I will briefly start by just uh, reviewing the basic functionality of these superconducting quantum bits. And I hope this will work because there's actually a thunderstorm going on here in Karlsruhe and I'm still getting the internet over the telephone line. So I hope this will persist for this uh, hour. Okay, so after the introduction to the um, superconducting quantum bits, I'm going to focus on the uh, weak points of this uh, approach. So it turns out that if we make these superconducting quantum bits with our current technology, then we will find many parasitic quantum bits inside the materials of these quantum bits. So actually it turns out that uh, these materials here uh, contain microscopic um, degrees of freedom, microscopic quantum bits, if you wish, two-state quantum systems, uh, which are depicted here. And uh, if you see this animation, then you can see that the, these are related actually to some atoms which cannot really decide in which position they want to be. And uh, this is really a problem because it generates the major source of decoherence, which of course uh, produces errors in these uh, qubits. And that's why we really have to attack this problem and somehow solve it. And in the main part of my talk, uh, it's going to be about my research where we are actually uh, using quantum bits in order to learn more about these defects. We use the qubits as a detector and also as a means to manipulate the quantum states of the individual defects here in order to learn something about them, where they come from, for example, what they actually are, and maybe how we can get rid of them. So, um, yeah, so the uh, superconducting quantum bits um, are described here. So we are also working with, with so-called transmon qubits, which you can understand is maybe the most simple qubit that there is. It basically just consists of this capacitor here, which may uh, carry a charge that oscillates through a Joseph's internal junction to the other side of this capacitor and back again. And so you can imagine that in this uh, mode of this qubit, which actually can be understood as like a nonlinear uh, resonator, nonlinear LC oscillator, you would have an oscillating charge across this capacitor and therefore also an AC electric field there. Yeah, so this torsion junction is uh, very important because it allows us to generate uh, nonlinear potential wells, which then have discrete transition frequencies. So we can just use the lowest ones as the qubit states. And here's an example of a fabricated quantum bit from the uh, Princeton group. And uh, I just chose this picture because it has a nice resemblance to this circuit schematic. So here you can just see this large capacitor here and the uh, connecting junction would be found in the middle here. You would have to zoom in uh, a lot to see it and then you would find something like this. So the Torsen town junction just consists in still all cases of uh, good working qubits, let's say, uh, from a sandwich made from two aluminum electrodes separated by a thin uh, tunnel barrier, for which usually just the aluminum oxide of the bottom electrode is used. Um, and this is another very popular version of the transmon qubit, the so-called crossmon or xmon, developed in the labs of John Martinez. And you see basically the same schematic, but here now the uh, capacitor has here this form of this cross and the ground plane provides the opposing electrode. And you can also see that this uh, qubit electrode is connected to the ground plane here via two choices in junction in this case. This allows you to put a little bit of a magnetic flux here via some control line. And by this you can tune the resonance frequency of these qubits. 
So this cross shape here, uh, the idea behind is just that you can then arrange these qubits in kind of two-dimensional arrays, like uh, artistically depicted here. And by this, you already form a quantum processor. And so because basically um, any qubit can interact with some neighbors, you could also imagine to use some of these qubits as tunable couplers. And yeah, this is, forms the fabric of the quantum computers, as you find in modern processors, for example. This is the Sycamore processor from Google. And in the repetition from the uh, Chinese universities, you see that this upper chip here actually carries this qubit layers, which is then just a flip chip bonded on a carrier chip that, for example, hosts the readout circuitry and the control circuitry. And while Rigetti Computing uh, is exploring a scaling up towards more and more qubits using some lateral connections between these quantum chips using in capacitive couplers here, IBM uh, yeah, explores new vertical levels uh, by stacking up in, uh, in this vertical integration. And you have here the qubit layer, um, resonator layer, and control layers nicely separated. Yeah, and these could be all ways to scale up, and it's really exciting to see what's going on here. And um, I'm, I'm really curious to see uh, where we will be at the end of the century uh, with this technology. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, um, but of course, uh, my, my talk is uh, not about uh, the, um, let's say, great points. My talk should focus on the weak points or on the dark side of these quantum processors. And of course, I'm talking about uh, the limitations of this current technology. And it turns out that uh, the major limitation that we have uh, uh, with these processes uh, currently is uh, decoherence. So as you all know, decoherence just um, signifies the loss of information about the qubit's quantum state um, because it interacts undesiredly with some parasitic some states in the environment. And here's a picture illustrating this model. Um, I guess also you all probably know how this uh, Leggett model of decoherence works. I just want to show this picture because at some point I spent too much time to make it with Poffray software. Anyway, so you have here the qubit and you have here an environment that contains many modes and some of them may be somehow coupled to the qubit. And that's why if you have some excitation in the qubit, uh, this energy may find a way to the environment, which means that the qubit would just spontaneously decay back to the ground state under emission of its energy as if in the form of a photon or phonon. And if you uh, measure uh, many, many, many qubits, then you would find a half lifetime uh, for this uh, de decay, decaying states, or the so-called energy relaxation rate, or the inverse T1 time. And this T1 time is one of the most important uh, figure of merits for these qubits. You just want to have as high as possible the T1 time, because this, of course, limits the time during which your qubit stays coherent, so during which you can do uh, reasonable quantum calculations. There's another um, decoherence effect called uh, defacing. This is um, measured by a so-called T2 time, and it basically emerges from fluctuations of this energy level splitting here, so of the resonance frequency of this qubit, which can also exist due to low frequency fluctuation um, coupling to, this, to, to the energy splitting of this qubit. Um, and uh, this is actually an interesting plot here. This is uh, a graph of the achievable T1 coherence time of the qubits uh, plotted as a function, uh, well, as an overview of the history of the superconducting quantum bits. And you know, everything started in the year 1999 with these experiments by Nakamura on the charge qubit. And then there was a very rapid evolution of these T1 times. So every three years, we got a factor of 10 longer coherence times, really nicely exponential scaling here. And this uh, um, covers here the development of the phase qubit in Martinez group, the flux qubit in Hans Moyes group, and also the transmon, which emerged from the charge qubit at Yale. And you see the transmon now is uh, just the workhorse of all this field. So also all the processors, these open stars, are build, being built on these uh, transmon qubits currently. And uh, I already have and drawn this uh, this red dashed line here, which um, indicates that we may have hit actually some kind of hard wall already like 10 years ago. So this kind of evolution seems to have stalled a little bit. It's much more difficult now to get better coherence times than it was uh, in the gold rush years here. So, and this is unfortunate because at the current levels of coherence times, uh, you would still require a huge overhead in the number of physical qubits that you would require to, to form one completely error-corrected logical qubit. 
and um, I cannot really uh, give a more precise estimate here because it's still not clear what will happen uh, in larger scales. It depends also on the architecture, of course, of the processor and many other details. But definitely, uh, it would be very helpful for us if this um, barrier would not be there and if you could further push uh, the coherence times to higher values. Um, so the question is, what is actually limiting us here? And in this talk, I'm giving a few arguments that material defects may be the major culprit uh, forming this hard wall here. So what are these defects? Um, okay, here's another picture of the uh, transform qubit. You see the chosen junctions here. And if you would again look inside this junction, you would find just a tunnel barrier made from aluminum oxide uh, separating the two electrodes here. And now, since this tunnel barrier is typically just an amorphous, uh, it's amorphous material, simply because you usually just use the thermally grown oxide on this aluminium here, uh, this amorphous materials uh, can contain uh, these tunneling atoms here. So some of these atoms actually can uh, switch their positions by quantum tunneling, and you can also think about some group of atoms changing their configuration between basically two states. And this is a very famous kind of defect. It has been studied already since long time, since more than 50 years, in a research field that's a bit different. That's actually the research field of uh, glasses. <laughs> so um, this started in the 1970s when people just uh, got their hands on dilution refrigerators, which became more, more uh, available. And then it was reasonable, for example, to just take a piece of glass, make maybe a microscope slide, to cool it down to low temperatures below one Kelvin, and then putting just a heat on one side and a thermometer on the other side, you can already measure something like the specific heat, for example. And now it turns out that if you measure the specific heat of an amorphous material, um, then um, it will be much higher than that of a crystalline material, even containing the same atoms. And the specific heat tells you how much energy you need to apply on your heater to heat up this material by a certain degree of Kelvin. And if you need more of this energy to heat up the amorphous material, this already tells you that there must be something inside this glass which absorbs these phonons so that they don't end up in the thermometer. So from this measurement, you can conclude that uh, these glasses uh, should contain intrinsic states which have these low excitation energies so that they contribute here to the specific heat at low temperatures. And there's another experiment which you can do with the setup. Uh, you can, for example, measure how easily the energy travels from your heater to your thermometer. This is the thermal conductivity. And you see that the amorphous material um, has a much higher say, resistance to, towards this heat flow, probably because of the scattering uh, centers, which uh, are related to these intrinsic states here. But actually, uh, it's not so, uh, the, the real uh, mysterious thing about these glasses is that it doesn't really matter what kind of material you measure here. You can take any material that is amorphous and you will get even quantitatively exact values of, for example, the thermal conductivity at low temperatures. And this is really remarkable. And just to, to, to note this, uh, this is uh, biatomic glasses, while all, everything with the P here is a polymer. So a very long and organic molecule like polypropylene or polyethylene. PMMA is very well known to people fabricating qubits because it's the photoresist that we use to pattern these uh, thin film circuits. So it's amazing that it um, doesn't matter what kind of atoms you use, uh, as long as they are arranged in an amorphous material, you seem to have basically very universal properties of these glasses. And this is really a long-standing misery that is still uh, being investigated um, and, try to, and people still try to explain it. New theories are being developed constantly and uh, it's, uh, it's still a very interesting question what's actually going on in this amorphous material. Um, so uh, we can now, of course, try to model to work with that, even if we don't really know what's actually tunneling there. So we can forget about what's actually tunneling there for the moment and try to model it. And uh, for such a two-state system, a reasonable approach is just to start from a double well potential model, where each of the two wells basically corresponds to one of the two possible states. So the atom could be in this well or in that well. But an atom is a quantum particle, so we, of course, uh, better describe it by wave functions, which would always extend over both wells and have a probability amplitude in each of them. So basically, the particle can quantum tunnel through this barrier at a certain tunnel rate, delta not. Uh, and uh, in addition, you have also, of course, uh, one of these wells can be more preferred energetically, and this is described by some asymmetry energy epsilon which enters the TLS simultaneously and then just as this um, energy bias here on the main diagonal. 
So for um, this talk, it will be important to remember that this asymmetry energy here um, will depend on external parameters. And one is the electric field and another one is the mechanical strain in the material. And you can understand this from this uh, illustrative model here. If you have a tunneling atom here, you have a charge which moves by a certain distance. So you have an electric bubble moment, which uh, you know couples to electric fields. So you can imagine if you apply DC electric field there, you just drag this charge more to the one side or the other side. And this allows you accordingly to change your symmetry energy. And likewise, if you would uh, change the strain, you just push on the atoms, they change a little bit their, uh, their distance to this uh, tunneling atom. And that's why also they would just similarly change local fields and accordingly couple to the asymmetry energy. And uh, this is actually what makes these qubits, uh, sorry, these TLS so detrimental for a variety of um, systems. Um, because you basically have this interaction uh, by, by electric field and mechanical strain by which this defect can couple to qubits, quasi particles, other TLS, phonons, and many other things that you can imagine coupling to strain of, or, or electric field. And now, uh, what will also be important later is uh, that if you change now the, uh, the asymmetry energy here, then you would see that the uh, transition, transition energy or the resonance frequency of this defect would follow such a hyperbolic uh, curve here, where the symmetric double potential for zero asymmetry would just um, correspond to resonance frequency given by the tunneling energy. Um, Okay, and yeah, that's, uh, these two coupling mechanisms are why, uh, why these defects uh, affect many various devices. For example, the coupling to strain uh, provides damping in micromechanical resonators, like you use as the strings for these nano guitars here. You can imagine if they uh, vibrate, the strain is continuously changing, changing the symmetry energy of the double potential. TLS may be stimulated to emit the energy via phonons, and this just provides a damping mechanism. Also, very large uh, devices can actually uh, be affected by defects. And uh, a large device is, for example, LIGO, the gravitational wave interferometer. You know, this is this huge Michelson interferometer having uh, mirrors at uh, four kilometer long ends. And uh, these mirrors here are typically coated with an amorphous layer of titanium oxide in order to uh, maximize the reflectivity. And now it turns out that if you um, uh, it turns out that actually the ultimate sensitivity of this LIGO is limited by the mechanical noise of these defects in this amorphous titanium oxide uh, coating of these mirrors. And I found this really remarkable because, uh, you know, the LIGO sensitivity is enormous. It's really amazing. I mean, every idea has been put to work to make it, to bring it to the edge. And it was interesting to note that at the end, the TLS defects actually seem to play the limiting role. Um, okay, of course, also all kinds of quantum systems are affected by these uh, defects. For example, you can have these defects on the uh, electrodes of uh, ball traps for uh, use, used for ion traps. Then they would generate, for example, excess heating or part potential fluctuations. Uh, you could also have the defects on the electrodes of semiconductor qubits, therefore providing charge noise. And of course, superconducting qubits will be affected by these uh, defects. And there will now go into more detail. Unfortunately, the situation uh, with the superconducting qubits is not so simple. I mean, uh, it's, as I said, we are not yet sure that we are really dealing with this atomic tunneling systems here. In fact, there's no shortage on alternative models which could explain the noise that we see. And here's just a few references to a few theoretical models or experimental um, hints. So you can have, for example, also alien atoms saturating some, uh, some, some electron bond here. For example, hydrogen is known to, uh, to diffuse easily into such a barrier. And then, of course, you would also have some dangling atom there. It could also be um, that some uh, electron is involved. For example, a quasi-particle could be trapped here at a metal insulator interface state. Uh, you could also have resonances between quasi-particles and holes, forming and Dreyer fluctuators. Um, there can be contra resonances and uh, also phononically dressed electrons. So there's really a large variety of um, suggestions what can actually go on in this uh, subvertine qubits. And so far, one can really say that it's not yet clear what happens there. And uh, these defects in the tunnel barrier of the junctions are not the only problem. Uh, because you also typically make uh, these um, qubit electrodes from aluminium 
but you can also take another material. Most materials form an oxide layer, an amorphous oxide layer, uh, on top. So you can imagine that if you um, imagine the cross section here through this electrode, you would find this electrode lying on the substrate here, and then you have again this uh, cover uh, of amorphous um, oxide of the cubit electrodes metal, and this of course can contain again atomic tunneling systems. And uh, since this is now an interface that is exposed to atmosphere at some point, you can imagine that you have also adsorbates there, for example, hydrogen or oxygen coming from the air, from water, for example. And uh, these hydrogen adsorbates actually are one of the very few uh, cases that people actually identified that their microscopic nature. And this was uh, done by Sebastian de Graaf in, uh, in very nice experiments uh, together with friends from Chalmers and from NPL. But in general, we still are not sure what is actually going on here. So what is the major reason for this um, noise in the cubits? In addition, you can also have, for example, residuals. This could be, for example, photoresist that you used in uh, to etch these uh, structures here and which could not be completely uh, dissolved. And uh, you, you have heard that PMA, which you use for this photoresist, often actually is a very nice glass former. So definitely you would find uh, TLS there if you just leave it lying around here. In addition, you can, of course, have contamination. And if you should try to wash away every, every dirt here, using, for example, Aragon iron milling in order to spot away all this uh, uh, dirt here, then you should be careful not to um, sputter too hard because this may actually destroy the crystalline nature of your substrate so that by trying to clean the TLS away, you may actually actively in introduce these defects into your substrate. So it's a very, really delicate um, business to fabricate a good quantum bit. So there's a lot of stuff that can go wrong. And um, yeah, this actually is one of the largest challenge, challenges of these quantum processes in the current technology that we need to deal with these kinds of defects there. And Jürgen, minor curiosity about the picture here. Uh, the absorbates, I guess they don't have to only be surface absorbates uh, as maybe shown in the picture, I guess, or maybe you have it actually there. Um, they can also penetrate inside of of the material as well. In principle, of course, yeah, this hydrogen, for example, could just diffuse inside this um, uh, oxide layer, of course, yeah. Yeah, I, I guess you do have a high, I see this red little dot uh, with an arrow inside. Yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah that's this hydrogen. <laughs> it's a very nice, very nice graphic, thank you. And this is actually the part of the uh, molecular structure of PMMA, just to mention it. <laughs> Okay, good. So how do now these defects uh, generate decoherence? Um, okay, let's talk first about the defects in the chosen junction. As I said, uh, such a tunneling atom would have electric dipole moment, and we can estimate it just by assuming that maybe one electron here on this ion would be moved by one angstrom, so 10 to minus 10 meters, which is certainly a very um, atomic size compatible um, dipole moment. And now the cutting strength between this defect and the qubit is just given by the dipole moment of this defect times the AC electric field amplitude in this uh, in this junction, which which comes from the plasma oscillation mode of the qubit. And uh, this electric field here now actually can be very strong, because you have this very uh, short distance between the capacitor electrodes. So this means that in a junction easily you have AC field strength of two kilowatts per meter, which then even with these small uh, dipole moments gives you a coupling strength, a maximum coupling strength of about 50 megahertz. Uh, I think the square is wrong here, sorry. But this is just the maximum possible value. Also the exact value depends of course on the orientation between the dipole and the electric field. So of course the maximum coupling will only be when they are parallel. And also the asymmetry energy of the defect um, uh, plays a role in this effective coupling here. But okay, this, this is certainly a certain maximum coupling strength. And now this strong coupling here actually um, makes it easy for us to, to detect these defects in the junction because this very strong coupling generates splittings in qubit spectroscopy. And this was the, actually how, how, this, how, how these defects were first detected in these qubits in measurements again by Tom Martinez. And you see here two different qubits having different junction sizes. And this is the qubit resonance frequency here uh, which is um, interrupted by many avoided lower crossings due to the resonances with this individual defect. So you have a defect here and another one here and there. And you see already that each defect is different. I mean, it's a random uh, random, random object, basically. It can be oriented differently, giving different double moments. And um, of course, this corresponds then also to different uh, coupling strengths. Um, 
And yeah, actually this very strong coupling strength here allow uh, us to play some games with this defect. So we can actually um, go to the time domain and try to um, see the quantum dynamics. And uh, for example, this can be done simply by not measuring the spectrum, but by measuring the decay of the COVID. So you have here the COVID probability. We start with a nearly 100% population, and then quickly the COVID decays. And at some frequencies, actually, here the COVID decays faster. And uh, if you now uh, measure this in the following way, that you basically just uh, populate your COVID using a pipe pulse, then you can apply a flux pulse to quickly tune the COVID to some probing frequency, stay some time there to let it interact with some modes, and then you just tune it back and you measure it. And uh, then you can quickly make these kind of measurements. Sometimes we call this soft spectroscopy. And if you look closely at what happens here in resonance with the COVID, so if you tune the COVID in resonance with the defect, you get actually swap oscillations. So you see that the COVID gives up its energy uh, to the defect uh, and it takes not a long time until it comes back. It's actually this, uh, this um, uh, oscillations are just the typical I swap oscillations that you may know from two coupled COVID experiments. The difference is, of course, that you have now a macroscopic quantum bit and a microscopic defect inside, which undergo this uh, entangled states here, or this coupling. And uh, you also see um, if you leave this energy if sometime in the defect, you get actually more back than if you would have, have it just in an isolated COVID that was uh, measured outside of any resonance with the defect. And in this case, this tells you that your defect actually lives longer than your COVID. So you may think about using it as a quantum memory or so, but in fact, this statement is only true if you use a bad COVID, let's say. So these were measurements done on a phase quantum bit that just had a T1 time of 100 nanoseconds. And that's why the defects back in those days were still better than the Kubits. Um, nevertheless, you can, of course, then also uh, try to see these uh, quantum dynamics in these defects because you're able to read out the state of the defect at the end. And what's possible actually is that you just um, shoot your microwave at the resonance of your avoided level crossing while your Kubit is detuned far away so that the TLS is also kind of isolated. But it still receives this, this microwave uh, signal here via some Raman transition that basically the Kubit here is just acting as an antenna for the T defect. And this allows you to directly drive uh, radio oscillations in these defects, uh, measure T1 re energy relaxation, and of course also apply multi-part sequences like Ramsey fringes or spin echo. And yeah, this uh, now is very nice because you can now for the first time really measure the quantum dynamics of individual defects using the Kubit as a nice uh, tweezers or nice tool to, to not only provide the control but also the readout. Okay, so what else we can learn from these measurements is actually that uh, we have a certain density of defects. We can just count the number of splittings here, for example, in a one gigahertz frequency range, and relate this to the dielectric volume of our tunnel barrier. And this is the typical number here, about 1,000 defects per gigahertz and square cubic micrometer, sorry, and cubic micrometer. And this is a typical number actually also uh, found in most of these glasses that have been measured since 50 years. And as I said, uh, most of these amorphous materials are very similar, not only, uh, for example, also similar in the densities of defects which they have. And that's why as soon as you take an amorphous material, you typically find uh, defect concentrations uh, which are compatible with this number here. So is this now a problem for us? Mm, not so much, maybe, because you can think that you could make a very small junction. And so typically a small junction would be just uh, shown here. This is about 250 nanometer times 200 nanometer. Um, and then if you just multiply this with this uh, density here, you get about 0.1 defects per gigahertz. And that sounds not too um, scaring. I mean, yeah, it's unlikely that your COVID is in resonance with such a defect, but you can just estimate the decay rate, which is only due to a single defect that the COVID, which itself would have an infinitely long T1 time, would experience. And this decay rate is just given by the product of the, by the square of the coupling strength here between COVID and defect which can be up to 50 megahertz, as I, as I told you. And this is a Lorentzian resonance function, which has here, uh, which is the resonance of the defect, uh, where here this uh, decay rate of the defect is this 100, 1 over 100 nanoseconds that I've shown you before. And that is the detuning between the defect and the crude. Now, if you have uh, uh, 0.1 TLS per gigahertz, this means the average spacing between defects would be like 10 gigahertz. And so, then the best detuning to the code would be like five gigahertz if you put it exactly in the middle. 
And if you now just put the five megahertz, sorry, five gigahertz the tuning there and the other parameters, then you find that the acuity one time is already reduced to only 500 microseconds, only due to the single defect, uh, more or less detuned far away from the current. And now you can imagine uh, if you take into account also the second defect on the other side of the five gigahertz tuning, and also take into account maybe a second junction for having a tunable DC squid covert, then you already are reduced to 125 microseconds for these two TLS at these current densities. And these 100 microseconds are already pretty um, close to values that we find if you are lucky and if you make really good covets. So it's typical average values of the T1 time. And this may already be a hint that the defects uh, may be one of the biggest uh, reasons for this short T1 times. What you can definitely be sure is that um, this distribution, the frequencies at which these defects appear will be very random. Each identically fabricated covert will have their defects at a different position. And that's why you can expect that you get a certain spread of your T1 times across a wafer, for example. And this is what I, sh what I, what I would like to see here, for example. These are the T1 times of Google's uh, Sycamore processor and um, I also plotted the histogram here, so you see you have typically a huge spread of T1 times, which can be up to plus minus 50% of this average T1 time. And just yesterday I found uh, the T1 times of the new uh, IBM um, Eagle processor online, and uh, you also see here uh, this wide spread distribution. But it's very nice to see that the average T1 time is now, uh, even in this upscaled version, uh, much better than before. So 100 microseconds is a very promising number, I would say. But still, of course, you have this 50% uh, plus minus total width of this distribution here, which is uh, most likely just um, given by these random occurrences of defect resonance frequencies in each junction. Quick question here again from the audience about um... Uh, it seems like the TLS and lifetimes are generally pretty low, um, mm -hmm. but um, have there been reports in the literature of very long TLS lifetimes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like all other other parameters of the defect, like that for a moment and so on and so forth. This, uh, this is of course a distribution of possible T1 times in this model. And um, actually the theory says that there should be a maximum uh, for the probability to have short uh, lifetimes and another maximum to have rather long lifetimes in these defects. Uh, the defect lifetime, of course, also depends on the density of your uh, defects in the material. The more you have, the more likely it is that they just interact and, and each of them would then uh, probably achieve a shorter T1 time. But it's uh, true that there's also uh, longer living defects. Um, and I can tell you from my experiments uh, where I have measured maybe a few hundred defects already within different covets and materials and the best what I found was 10 microsecond T1 time which was a single occasion basically um, but it's also true that um, of course um, uh, this may just be bad luck maybe uh, if you look at measurements of glasses then of course you can get better kind of uh, statistics on the lifetimes for example if you just measure how long it takes for glass to cool down to low temperatures after you have uh, after you fired up your fridge. So uh, you will see that actually a glass cools on very slowly because you have can also have uh, TLS which have a very long uh, kind of lifetime, which is actually the tunneling time from this meter stable upper state to the ground state. And that's why, um, yeah, there can be very long living effects state in these glasses. But um, so far what we see with qubits, um, 100 nanoseconds T1 time for these qubits is actually, for these defects, is actually a very typical number that I uh, found very, find very often. Yeah. Okay, so 100 nanoseconds, with, you've seen up to 10 microseconds, and maybe there's things at milliseconds, but we don't know too much. Um, yeah, uh, we really don't know so much, and I, I'm not aware of any any good uh, results uh, that that show that these defect bars could really have such long, uh, long longer lifetimes. Um, there's a recent publication by Martin Schwicker, also from uh, KIT Group, who uh, did also see some some very long time effects in in uh, fluxonium qubits, and uh, yeah, so this is actually a hint that there may be defects or some other other um, states in, in, in these environments of these uh, qubits, which may have a longer life, lifetime or longer realization rates. Um, but for these defects, which I'm at least uh, studying here, this is a reasonable number to quote. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you very much. Okay. So these defects in the junction seem to be a problem. They definitely reduce T1 times and introduce the spread here. 
but you also have these defects on the electrodes. So how about those? Um, so we can just estimate again the coupling strength of such a defect somewhere here at the edge of this qubit electrode uh, to the qubit simply by estimating the electric field strength here. This is uh, done here in a simulation where we plot the amplitude of the AC electric field due to the qubit plasma oscillation mode. And you see that this field strength can reach up to 10 volts per meter here at this um, edge of this qubit electrode. And if you take this, uh, well, actually, there's of course a hot spot here where this qubit electrode um, touches the substrate. There, the fields are a bit larger, but yeah, let's say 10 volts per meter is a good average value. And this would correspond to a coupling strength now of only 250 kilohertz, so much less than these 50 megahertz that I quoted for these junction defects. Um, and accordingly, such a defect at even at resonance would only limit the T1 time to 80 microseconds. Um, but how likely is it now to have a defect at resonance? This actually would be much more likely because you have here basically a huge area where these defects can uh, can sit. So you have like one millimeter long uh, edge of the qubit electrode here. The ground plane gives another millimeter long thing. And then of course, 50 nanometer uh, area here. So this is a certain a significant kind of area. And accordingly, you have also much more defects there, uh, which are all much more weakly coupled, but in common larger numbers. And you can actually see those defects if you just measure the energy relaxation rate of the qubit as a function of the qubit frequency. And then you see uh, there's a certain base level here, which in our case here corresponds to 10 microseconds T1 time, but at certain frequencies you have a much enhanced energy relaxation rate. And some of these peaks here I colored in red, these just signify now, uh, reveal now the individual resonances of these defects, which follow this um, this um, Lorentzian resonance curve here. So the suggestion is to minimize this periphery and, and try to have a, a different area mm -hmm. to, to circumference ratio. This would be one strategy to try to minimize this, maybe make a circular qubit rather than this cross here should, should be better. Um, also, you could, of course, try to dilute the electric field here to make it weaker simply by separating the electrodes further apart. However, you will always uh, lose in capacitance then, and you need, of course, a certain capacitance to uh, come to the transmon regime. So, um, yeah, but in principle, these are the two geometric options, let's say, that you have here to play with your coupling to the defects. So, but um, I mean, how sure can we be that these resonances actually come from defects and not from something else? And this is now where my own research uh, started. We tried to see whether we can actually um, somehow manipulate, tune these defects by, for example, mechanical strain. As we have seen, these defects should respond to the strain. And we tried this simply by installing our Cooper chip here in such a metallic holder. Where we, on the back side had a piezo actuator which was just pressing against this qubit chip. And you know that if you apply this voltage to the piezo, the piezo gets longer, and therefore we could actually um, tune the force by which, which the piezo is pressing against this chip just by a voltage source. And so this means we can control the mechanical strain by this applied piezo voltage. And then we just basically had to again measure the um, energy relaxation rate of the qubit as a function of qubit frequency, again using this uh, rather fast um, soft spectroscopy protocol. And our expectation was, of course, that then if we change the strain now, we should see that the position of these peaks follows these hyperbolic dependencies as we would have expected from the double well potential model. So we now change the mechanical strain and all these peaks should move along these hyperbolas. And this is such a result from such an experiment. Now again, you see the T1 time of the qubit uh, color coded as a function of qubit frequency and applied piezo voltage. And you see these dark pixels where we have basically bad coherence times do really accumulate along these hyperbolic traces here. And so this now nicely reveals the resonances of all these individual TLS really, um, can say these are TLS because we find these, um, these hyper hyperbolic uh, coupling to the, to the mechanical strain and everything seems to be nicely explained um, yeah, by this uh, double of potential model, by the standard tunneling model. Are there competing uh, theories on what could explain this other than TLSs? As, as I said, um, so uh, in general, this uh, standard tunneling model 
based on the double potential works without um, a, a microscopic model of this defect. So as long as you have this double potential, which is very likely to have for, for various kinds of, of, of defect implementations, then, then you would get these hyperbolas basically here. Yeah. Well, in addition, we can say, of course, that, um, for example, um, dipole moments and also coupling strengths to strain, which you can also extract from these measurements here, uh, they are also compatible with these measurements obtained on glasses. So in that sense, um, everything also seems to be still compatible that these defects in this uh, in these qubits are still the same that we have in our classes or that we're studying in the classes. But this is of course not a final word. Okay. Um, yeah, if you look closer here, actually you see one line which is not depending on the mechanical strain. And it turns out that this was also not a defect. This was just a parasitic resonance or the resonance from a second qubit on the same chip. So we could actually move this by applying some flux. And this nicely shows that such a strain tuning measurement allows you to distinguish uh, defect resonances from parasitic circuit resonances, which can also be very helpful to debug your microwave engineering here. And yeah, these measurements are really very uh, useful because, yeah, as I said, for the first time, you can look inside this material and see the defects individually, like in uh, Wilson's uh, cloud chamber, where the, for the first time you could see the radioactive atoms uh, moving around. So that's why I show another um, example here. This was also an old data obtained on the face COVID. So you have short T1 times here, and all defects here are found in torsion junctions. And um, I would like to point out that you often see also some anomalies in these uh, measurements, so non-hyperbolic traces. For example, one trace which looks suspicious is this one here, which is more like a horizontal line with some step function here. And at some point we uh, found such a signature again and studied it closer. And you see that such a signature actually is um, comes from two uh, interacting defects. So you may have just two TLS which are close enough to each other so that they can uh, effectively interact by the electric dipole coupling. And uh, what we now see here in the signature is the resonance of a certain TLS called TLS1, which by itself does not couple so much to the strain, so you just see basically a horizontal line here. But there's a second defect, TLS2, uh, which you can tune by the strain and which we also can tune through its symmetry point. And if you do this, then the location of the ground state changes from one well to the other well. So we basically flip this defect. And if you do this, we see that TLS1 responds with an adjustment of its uh, energy splitting. So um, this basically just is a typical longitudinal coupling. You see that the energy of one defect depends on the state of the interacting defect. And this is just what we can uh, directly see here by tuning this defect through the symmetry point. And we can, of course, go further and tune TLS2 in resonance with T TLS1, which happens here and there. And accordingly, we see here and there the world lower crossings opening up, which then uh, tell us how much of an exchange coupling strength we have between these two interacting defects. And so this uh, just nicely shows that these measurements now allow us to really completely characterize and investigate even uh, coupled uh, defect systems, use, uh, basically with uh, access to the individual uh, constituents. And yeah, so this just shows that these are really powerful measurements from which we can, uh, can learn a lot. And um, these are other anomalies. For example, here was one defect which started to develop its hyperbola and then suddenly it um, decided to jump to another symmetry energy. So it jumped up here and started again here. So there's random uh, discrete fluctuations of the asymmetry energy of some defects. And also you can see this one here where the resonance frequency of one defect actually shows telegraphic switching as a function of time. And now this is also a very uh, important mechanism. And uh, it is explained by uh, the following that this defect that we can see here, which has a rather high frequency, so close to the COVID, so that we can actually measure it using the COVID. Such a high frequency defect may be coupled actually to a low frequency defect, which may be physically the same thing. It just has an excitation energy below the thermal energy, KBT, so that uh, you can actually treat it as a random a classical thermal fluctuator, just switching randomly between its two states without much coherence involved. But uh, since if this uh, kind of uh, thermal fluctuator uh, is able to interact using this longitudinal coupling with this high frequency defect, then this high frequency defect would just have a changing resonance frequency, which follows the state of this thermal uh, fluctuator here. 
And this is exactly what you can see here. Uh, actually, this de defect here is kind of the it heralds the state of this thermal fluctuator. And uh, this is, of course, now very bad for COVID because you can imagine if you have a COVID close uh, um, in vicinity to this uh, defect PLS1, then you could, for example, uh, assume that the COVID gets repelled always when this uh, defect comes a little bit closer to the COVID by some kind of dispersive shift, if you wish. And this is also something that we found at some point. We just measured the resonance frequency of a transform COVID here for a long time, and actually also could identify these kind of uh, telegraphic switchings between basically two different resonance frequencies, most likely due to this interaction that the COVID uh, saw this TLS1 fluctuating due to this thermal fluctuator here. And uh, not only the resonance frequency of this COVID is, uh, may, may fluctuate, of course, um, when the TLS comes closer to the COVID, the T1 decay of the COVID would be enhanced. And that's also what uh, people now studied uh, more intensively in the recent years. Um, so for example, this is data from Jonathan Burnett uh, showing basically the dependent time dependence of the T1 time of a COVID. And you see that again, you have this uh, sudden jumps or slow, slow drifts in the T1 time. And if you make a histogram out of these data, you again find a typical spread of like, let's say plus minus 50% from the mean value in both directions just by yeah, waiting. And you can, of course, imagine that this is a very big problem for quantum computers because um, you would like to, at the beginning, calibrate everything to the highest precision. And of course, the exact resonance frequency of the COVID is one of the most important ingredients for high fidelity gates. So if this fluctuates, you can imagine that also your error rate would fluctuate and maybe just um, get worse and worse in time. Uh, that's why you need to continuously recalibrate your COVID, uh, your quantum processors, each COVID in your quantum processor, which of course leads to downtimes and makes it probably more difficult to um, determine whether a calculation was a random result or was actually the search result. How much of the fluctuation can we confidently attribute to, to TLSs in this behavior as opposed to yeah. other mm -hmm. mechanisms? Um, there's, of course, also quasi-particles, which are known to cause fluctuations. Um, so these can exist, for example, if a cosmic ray um, hits the, um, the chip and then uh, generates an avalanche of quasi-particles, which then, of course, would spoil the T1 time of many COVIDs. However, this is typically a short uh, time effect. I mean, these quasi-particles are re, uh, to recondense into COVID pairs after a uh, few milliseconds at the longest. And uh, these quasi particles will not explain these very slow dynamics here. However, as I've told you, defects have a very wide distribution of uh, tunneling rates and, of course, of barrier heights. So you find certainly always a distribution of fluctuating defects at different rates and coupling strengths to this defect. And this is much more compatible with such, uh, such uh, fluctuation data. Yeah? Um, and apart from uh, quasi particles, there's of course also surface spins, which are known to generate flux noise in, for example, DC squids. However, also uh, for concerned squid and spins, there's no uh, no really, I would say, good argument why they should have so slow uh, so slow dynamics here. But everything is uh, very well explained by by these defects. I see. So the belief is that most of the slow time dynamics are really or if not all of them are TLSs and some of the shorter term dynamics are quasi particles. Yeah. And well, there's also things like vortices, right? Vortices can get pinned or unpinned and move around. Right, uh, right. Yeah, it's always hard to keep track of all the different ways that things can go wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right. I guess one could also understand a single jump in good frequency by a vortex, which uh, found a new fitting center. So yeah, of course, yeah, this, this is also, can also be low frequency effect. Yeah. I don't know. Okay. Great, great, thank you. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, here's just another data um, uh, showing, again, some very global crossing here. Uh, the nice thing actually on these measurements was that you could just warm up your chip and cool it down again to see a completely new spectrum, basically, uh, which I think is mostly due to the fact that you would just uh, look into a different strain window. I mean, when you warm up and cool it down, you have, of course, uh, thermal dilatation of everything, and uh, this is all very sensitive to strain, so I'm not saying that when you warm up, all the defects re into new, or all atoms re into new defects, most likely you just look in a different window, and that's why you find different defects there. Okay, um, so, and the, now I will maybe come slowly to an end. So the next thing that we tried is, of course, besides strain tuning, you can also tune, you should be able to tune defects also with electric fields. 
And we tried this also recently, simply by installing two electrodes in our sample holder. So we had one electrode above the chip, one electrode below the chip, and just again applied a voltage between them to basically uh, expose the complete cooled chip to some DC electric field. And since I know that um, experimentalists like me always get to see pictures from the lab, here's my single picture from the lab. Um, this is uh, our sample housing. It's uh, silver coated copper. If you look inside here, you see the uh, cubit chip, uh, which is actually bolted to the bottom of the sample holder using these four titanium screws. And here, this copper uh, thing contains our piezo, uh, which presses through a hole in the bottom of this sample holder against the cubit chip. So by, by this, we control the strain and the electric field is generated here by this uh, top electrode, the upper one, which is just a piece of copper foil glued to the lid of the sample holder. And the bottom electrode is just installed here on the backside of this PCB chip. So it's a rather simple setup and you can now do experiments like this. Again, just measuring the T1 time of our curve is a function of the applied electric field or the applied voltage on these electrodes. And again, we can see some hyperbolas uh, which reveal the defects now on the electrodes because these are exposed to the electric field and they just respond as expected also to the field tuning. However, you also see much more horizontal lines now compared to the strain data. And it turns out that um, the only place where these electrodes do not generate any electric field uh, is the tunnel barriers inside the chosen junctions because um, well, we have a transmon and you will not be able to put any DC voltage across a chosen junction. It will just be compensated by cool pair tunneling. That's why uh, in the junctions you will never have any induced electric field, uh, DC electric field. And that's why you can now uh, identify all horizontal lines as defects being in the junctions. And this is a very nice thing. Now we can distinguish uh, these signatures from coming from defects on the surface and from those in the chosen junctions. And you can imagine this is again very nice just to debug your coverage fabrication to see uh, which part of the circuit is the major limitation for your direct, no, major contribution to dielectric loss. And we decided to measure this more systematically. We can in principle um, study the coupling of each defect to strain and electric field simply by following the resonance and um, tuning either the field and the strain. And uh, this is uh, how such a measurement can look like. So we basically recorded here the TLS traces or resonances and varied first the electric field by increasing a little bit the voltage up to five volts here. Then we just varied the mechanical strain and the field again and the strain again. And you see for defects in the torsion junction, they don't couple to the field, but they couple to strain. So you get these staircase kind of signatures here. Also basically staircase type hyperbolas, if you wish. But you can also find defects on the surface, which are tuned by the electric field and by the strain. And for example, this is a surface defect, which has a nice zigzagging hyperbola uh, up, to, up to the very top here. Yeah, and then basically you just uh, can fit all these traces to the hyperbolas, now depending on, of course, three parameters, the field, the strain, and the tunneling energy. And this is how such a fit to all these uh, resonances looks like. So yeah, you can get colorful insights uh, by these fittings. And also you can... Um, look at each individual vertical cross-section through this data here, which then of course reveals the reliance and resonances of each defect. And as I told you, these are given by this uh, decay rate formula containing some information about the coupling strength or the dipole moment of the defect and its coherence time. And so now with such a simple, well, with this measurement, you can now actually really uh, extract all intrinsic parameters uh, from the defect, so it's dafa moments, scale energy, and get some idea about dafa moments also, also coupling strength to qubit and coherence time. So um, you can learn a lot about defects. And this is just some kind of uh, analysis here, some statistical analysis uh, based on such data. So for example, now we can of course um, separately plot values from the junction defects and the surface defects because we can identify them. And we find very similar properties uh, for both of them. So for example, they couple equally strong to mechanical strain. Also coherence times are, are pretty much the same. And again, you see these have done seconds here. Um, and also their data moments are very similar for the for both types of defects. So in that sense, one could maybe say it's not really a need to postulate different models for defects there. These data seem to be compatible with a single defect. Which is also probably which is also compatible with what we know from these classes. 
Um, now you can actually ask, why do we have so many junction defects? I mean, we're using rather small junctions, obviously, here. And it turns out that, um, that uh, most of these defects that we find here are living in this large straight junction. So the straight junction is something that appears um, automatically when you do a conventional two-angle shadow evaporation. So at some point, you always have to place the top electrode on the oxidized bottom electrode. And if you make the connection to the ground plane, also the ground plane will carry this oxide, of course, and that's why you make this large straight junction. And if you make it very large, then you can be sure that it will not be a part of the Kubel dynamics, but it still contains a large tunnel barrier with a lot of defects. And actually, these are all the defects which are only in the straight junction. So actually, our statistics then it looks like this. We have only a few percent in the small junction, a largest part on the electrodes, and of course, a significant part in these straight junctions. And these are, of course, rather simple to get rid of. You just can basically get rid of your straight junction. And there's a technique for this uh, called bandaging. So you just um, put another small layer of aluminum film there to just short this straight junction. And then you automatically get 40% less dielectric loss in your qubits. Um, okay, however, this bandaging is a little bit of an uh, annoyance because it requires a complete third lithography step, uh, which likely also introduces new residuals from photoresist, for example. And just to mention it, uh, there's now new techniques to make junctions uh, using three angle shadow evaporation. You can in situ, so in the same signal um, uh, pumping step, let's say, not only deposit your junctions at two different angles, but at, under a third angle, you can also make these connections, for example, from the junction to the electro uh, ground planes or to short these um, parasitic junctions. And this is a development uh, in the group of Jonas Freilander from Chalmers. And this was done in our group by Alexander Bilmes. And this is comfortable not only for these Manhattan junctions, but for these um, Dolan Bridge junctions. Okay, so the last thing I would like to mention quickly is uh, that we can also um, again go back to this electric field tuning, um, but um, get more out of it if we, if we connect these electrodes separately to dedicated voltage sources, which are both reference to the on chip ground. And now you can imagine um, these two electrodes will generate very different field distributions in your chip. This is an example when you put half a volt on the top electrode. You see this top electrode mostly focuses the active field here on the top of the uh, electrode, while the bottom electrode mm, naturally just focuses more on the bottom here. And now this wasn't, the idea was that we could actually use this to determine the location of the defect along this electrode. So we would like to say whether it's here or there, for example. And we can do this simply by measuring the response or the coupling of each defect, both to the top electrode and to the bottom electrode. So we measure this ratio here, and then we just look into our simulation where we find a similar electric field ratio, at which position we find this ratio of the electric fields. And then we have basically a possible solution for the position of this defect. And by this, we are now actually able to distinguish whether these defects on the surface electrodes or on the surfaces actually, for example, are residing here on the very surface of this oxide layer, inside this oxide layer, or whether they, for example, are buried under this scoot electrode here. And uh, one such analysis um, um, produces such a result, for example. And in, 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 in our tested COVID, we found that the major contribution to defects were, were actually um, the defects which are residing at the very surface of this oxide layer here. And the second largest contribution were the defects here on the substrate, while here the substrate metal interface, uh, we found only a few defects, which is also explained by, because this is typically the most clean interface that you can make uh, in your fabrication. It's the first thing that you do, just depositing the sample on the pristine substrate. So um, this was expected actually. And I guess, again, you can of course um, understand that this is a useful measurement it can really help you nicely to debug your fabrication. In this case, probably we should have cleaned better the uh, the, the photoresist array to maybe get uh, reduce these numbers of defects on the substrate vacuum interface. But in general, I would say this is a very nice um, tool in order to to learn some well where your defects actually come from and what you should do to get rid of them. Okay, yeah, this is another um, just uh, idea to use uh, these defects as quantum spectrum analysis um, by basically measuring their coherence, the coherence rates. And this, of course, tells you something about the modes in the environment of your defects. 
uh, which also uh, may be helpful to understand what they actually are made up from. But okay, um, I guess I can conclude safely at this point. Uh, this is my summary slide. So I hope um, I work in, was convincing enough to tell you that material defects are really a serious challenge on the way to large uh, practical quantum processors. They cause energy relaxation and fluctuations of COVID frequencies. And also um, qubits uh, may be very nice, uh, actually are very nice tools and powerful tools to learn something about these defects. And uh, I hope we will learn enough about these defects uh, to find uh, solutions how we actually can get rid of them in order to enhance further our coherence times and make better quantum processes. So I would like to thank you very much, uh, first of all, my uh, my colleague Alexander Wilmes, who was uh, helping uh, with these experiments during uh, the last five, five to six years. And he had made very strong contributions to many of these um, many of these experiments, for example, Google fabrication was in Alexander's hands. And then I would like to uh, thank my sponsors, especially the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft and the Google company, without uh, who provided funding and long-standing uh, generous support, without which I would not have been able to continue at all with this research because of the regulations of the German educational policies. Um, so shout out to Ich bin Hanna. And finally, I would like to thank very much, um, of course, uh, you, you Slatko and, uh, and the Kiskit seminar group for having me here. And of course, uh, thanks for watching. And I hope it was a little bit interesting. Jürgen, thank you very much for the very nice talk and uh, beautiful pictures and results. Maybe we'll start with a very simple question. And I have a few from the audience. Uh, as we go through this, folks, please post your final questions in the comment chat box, and then I'll get them up to Jürgen. I can already see a few streaming in. Um, what's the actual physical displacement of the chip at the maximum displacement location from the left of the plot to the right of the plot? Right. So um, we uh, estimated this. Actually, we just measured it using um, at the end of the grid. So it's a counter vector uh, capacitor. And at helium temperatures, uh, the maximum um, length change of the grid so is maybe one micrometer only. Uh, so we uh, made some estimation that we actually bulge this COVID chip up to a radius of two kilometers long. So it's actually a really tiny change. Um, and the effective strain change that we then generate in this material is of the order of 10 to minus uh, seven. So in fact, I, I can tell you that uh, the two nanometer wide tunnel barrier is compressed by 10 to minus 15 meters at our at, at, uh, at typical voltages we apply. So by the fraction of the size of a nucleus. So uh, you would not see much uh, movement there in this material, actually. OK, that's very cool. So size of a nucleus, compression, about uh, one micrometer, I think you said. Uh, two nanometer on the, on the tunnel barrier. So the tunnel barrier is made thinner, yeah. let's say, by, by one nucleus. The, the chip bend uh, from, yeah, the, the chip displacement. And uh, OK, great, thank you. Um, Question from the audience, from Kidai. Thanks for the great talk. You mentioned in just the last slide, the inside uh, inside the oxide is only contributing about 8% of the total TLSs. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that um, the bulk of the oxide layer is epitaxial or morphous doesn't matter when it comes to reducing TLSs? Mm -hmm. whether, um, whether the material is amorphous or crystalline, it, it doesn't matter at all is um, the question because I, it's would such... say, I would not say it doesn't matter um what we found is just that um these defects that we detected with our COVID uh, were those defects which are which were at the very edge here because simply if you would have the defects inside this um oxide layer they would have a much weaker coupling strength because of the dielectric uh, dielectric permittivity of this material and that's why actually the defects which we uh, which we found were not compatible um, uh, so the solution for the for the for the position was not was not compatible with the place inside this oxide layer simply because they would be covered much more weakly in fact of 10 weeks more weakly let's say and that's why um, that's why our solution was that these uh, defects are lying on the on the very surface of this uh, oxide layer um, so this might may of course just be amorphous tunneling systems uh, very close to the surface here so then of course it would still make a difference whether you would make this a protection or in the amorphous uh, material, this oxide layer. 
question from Andrew following up on my question, which is with that level of strain of 10 to the minus 15 meters, exclamation mark, would vibrations at the chip not cause dependent chain, time dependent changes in the TLS effect on T2 mm -hmm. and T1? Um, well, this um, one would need to think about how much a vibration would actually change the strain inside the material. I mean, if you have just a, like a common uh, vibration of the whole thing, then it's not so necessary that the material itself also um, kind of oscillates, or the thickness of the strain oscillates with the same, same, uh, well, similarly. Um, so, so, so just to make sure, the, the strain change was 10 to minus 7 that we had uh, in total, not 10 to minus 15. Um, it's an interesting question, actually. Um, Maybe uh, maybe um, there there would be some residual uh, effect on on the mechanical vibrations. It would be very interesting to to estimate this more precisely. Huh? <laughs> maybe the question is: Have you tried playing you know heavy metal rock music at full volume <laughs> next to the chip? <laughs> we always play heavy metal rock music in our lab when we are doing experiments. <laughs> no, actually, we are choosing other music, but uh, no, we have not seen any effect on, on this now. Okay. And also not on vibrations so 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 much, yeah. But maybe we could uh, investigate this further. Yeah? Excellent. Um, great to always see new ideas come up during this question. From uh, if you have more questions, folks, or if I missed your question, post it in the chat. Um, how does all of this potentially help inform our? Does it help inform our qubit? design uh, the geometry. I guess I think it's a little more obvious at the material level and cleaning steps and so on, but are there things we learned about the way we should maybe shape the actual mm -hmm. layout of the qubits here as well? Um, or or maybe we abstract that away and then here just focus on the level of, of you know, cleanings and so on. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, well, I guess uh, we can, of course, learn this general conclusion that um, strong electric fields at some points are not good because you will get strong coupling to defects there. Then, of course, this means for Kubi design that everything should be optimized to, have, to avoid, for example, these hotspots here where you have points where you have field concentration and strong electric fields. Um, yeah, maybe this is, an, uh, this is an idea for Kubi design, maybe just trying to design uh, these electrodes in a way that yeah, you avoid these hotspots to get minimal electric fields there. I guess, yeah, but this was, would, call, of course, be general um, general knowledge from, from such uh, thoughts. Uh, then you could still, of course, use this technique and, and uh, try to test whether everything worked as expected. And of course, you can also try to not only um, measure the position of these electrodes here along these uh, edge, for example, you could also try lateral electrodes and maybe even produce complete two-dimensional um, maps of these uh, defects. And then this would nicely tell you, for example, whether you have any corners uh, of your design where maybe you cannot dissolve so nicely the photoresist, whether these are a problem. And, and I guess things like that could still be um, nicely studied with this technique. Yeah. Great. Um... Question, quick question from the audience. I'm not, let's see if, if this makes sense. How did you make sure whether a defect comes from the oxide, but not the oxide vacuum interface? Yeah, um, sorry, we find, find all defects here actually sitting basically on the oxide vacuum interface. So on the very surface here of this oxide. As I said, simply because inside this um, dielectric, we would expect smaller coupling strengths for the defects than we find. And that's why the possible solution for this uh, defect position from our analysis was was mostly here on the surface. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And uh, <laughs> you're stimulating a lot of questions, so it's really great to have this lively chat. Um, and the next question is about is from the audience, from Andrew. Uh, there seems to be evidence that junction aging changes the effect of Josephson energy of the junction, which changes in with changes in defects and lattice strain in the amorphous oxide. Have you looked at very fresh versus aged or annealed qubits? Uh, this is also a very interesting question. Yeah, um, this should be done probably. Um, in fact, I did do long-term measurements because some of the first phase qubits that I had, I was measuring for more than 10 years, but um, uh, on this, not in, on the level that I could uh, detect any of these changes that, that you mentioned. 
Um, it will be, would be very interesting to see how this junction aging uh, changes also the defect density in the barrier. So this could be very interesting also to learn where this aging actually comes from. So for example, to learn what is diffusing inside these um, tunnel barriers. Um, in, yeah, so, in yeah, go on. <laughs> yeah, just uh, we did not have, we did not do this, but it would be a very interesting, interesting thing to do. And I guess we we, we plan we are planning such measurements also. Yeah. Yeah, and you know some some labs certainly do uh, annealings of thermal annealings if there are junctions, which you have to be a little careful with. But uh, I don't know if you if you do that or have because you know, then you can potentially reduce the defects. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I if you more broadly, there's studies uh, how how much uh, there's studies on that and what the state mm -hmm. of the is. Exactly. Yeah, these will be very interesting experiments. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Sounds like you have a few new, few, few more things to go back to the lab, and you know we're all up the sleeves for. Oh, yes, uh, <laughs> awesome. to do. Yeah. As long as funding holds. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, seeing as we're almost 15 minutes over, folks, thank you for all your very many interesting and insightful questions. Thank you for tuning in and for staying for an extra 15 minutes. Um, Jurgen, any final words before we close here? No final words. Thanks for watching and uh, goodbye. All right. Folks, um, like, subscribe, you know the drill. And see you next week with Jens Koch on uh, some very awesome results on zero pi fluxonium and SC qubits. With that, it's great to be back. See you next week. <laughs>